We want to take uh, the next hour to ask some questions of all the panel. The, this is a roundtable discussion uh, just to continue uh, thinking about uh, Calvin's life and work and its effect on us. And so all of these are, are posed to everyone on the panel, just to answer as you desire. Why is John Calvin still important 500 years after his birth? Uh, obviously, all of your lectures gave reasons, but let's just summarize that again. Why is he important 500 years later? This end. Um, well, we can go around in circles here. He's, he's important because he was really the first great biblical exegete, almost in the history of the church. You know, other, other theologians caught it here and there, but um, uh, as I think Steve was saying, um, within the first year after he was converted, he comments on the fact that people were coming to him to ask him, you know, help us to understand the Bible. And I think he had this genius, and I'm pretty sure it lies behind his preaching as well, because he didn't, you know, he didn't preach with alliterated headings or he didn't tell stories. His sermons are very much shaped by the text. And it, I think it was that genius to be able to capture what the text was saying, where the text was leading, and what the implications of the text were that really lay at the foundation of, of everything, that, uh, the, everything that Steve commented on, which at the end of the day was everything, more or less. I think you missed out three things. <laughs> I think added to that is just his time in history. You know, we say in real estate, three important things, location, location, and location. Same is true in history and the context in which you find yourself. And the Reformation, Philip Schaff said, was uh, the greatest forward movement of Christianity since the first century. And so Calvin stood at a time in history, it was really the dawning of the, um, of the modern age. The printing press had just been invented. Ships were now leaving the continent, searching for a new world. Um, and Calvin stood at this time in history. Luther had preceded him, and so it was the perfect time for his ideas to explode in the world and to send men in ships and words into print in a way that could influence successive generations unlike those in previous generations. And Al could certainly comment on that as a historian, but part of his genius is just where he stood in history and the domino effect of what was set in motion that other good men then put their shoulder to the same plow and the Puritans and the Westminster divines and, and, and others just piggybacked off of what Calvin set in motion and there, were, there was just a multiplication effect, but he really I think got it going. Luther was the bull in the china shop that broke through. Calvin was the systematic genius put, pulling it all together. I certainly agree with all that. I think uh, one particular aspect of, of Calvin's life that helps to explain why he's so relevant today is because uh, he, he really was the combination of the systematician and the pastoral theologian, the preacher and the teacher, the founder of institutions, the reformer of the church. Uh, certainly you look back with so much appreciation to Martin Luther, but Martin Luther really didn't leave us a systematic theology. Uh, you look back to many of the other great figures of the church and no one seems to have left anything like all of this uh, that we have from Calvin. Calvin has a, a tremendous institutional shadow uh, which is rather unique among the, uh, the, the reformers, the magisterial reformers. The other thing about Calvin, when I think about the, the answering this question, and John, you know, the, I just have to speak as a theologian and say, here is Calvin's responsibility. In his day, to consider what was at stake, he understood the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is at stake, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the, this is the crucial question, where is the true church? What is the true gospel? And, uh, and how would a church be established upon the Word of God? The theological maelstrom uh, out of which, in which all this happened, uh, the confrontation with the Church of Rome. I mean, Calvin was doing theology with his life at stake. Uh, 
uh, this wasn't an esoteric ivory tower endeavor for him. He understood that life and death were hanging in the balance. He understood that the integrity of the church, the integrity of the gospel was in the balance. And I would suggest that the reason we're talking about him today is not just because of the role he played in the 16th century, but because we are facing the same challenges. Uh, no lesser need, no lesser urgency in our day. And uh, the fact is that uh, in the history of the Christian church, no one distilled the biblical answers to these questions with the quintessential clarity of John Calvin. And so we come back again and again and again. N not much to add. I, 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 you could say this, Calvin also taught the major people who mediated his biblical exposition uh, to the next generation to the point that those people were very effective in, in mediating uh, the teaching that he had synthesized and expounded from the scriptures. And a lot of times the people that were being influenced by Calvin in those days didn't know they were being influenced by Calvin because his name wasn't bannered around the way we do today. And I think that's a tribute to him that he was training the best of the teachers of the succeeding generation who educated a generation of folks who didn't necessarily know him firsthand. And we only later, especially in the 19th century, probably began to get a feel for the magnitude of what he had done, partly because of the staggering literary product of the man um, and uh, the way that he did manage to do first-rate exposition and at the same time do excellent biblical systematic theology and summarize. And, and we can go back, and if we're getting ready to think systematically or topically about a doctrine, we've got a hundred books that we can open up today. And yes, Christians had had manuals of theology stretching back into the late second century, but Calvin didn't have a single one that he could open up and rely on entirely. He was, he was operating out of the basis of excellent exposition and exegesis. So. Where should lay people start in learning, reading, familiarizing themselves with Calvin? Well, can I think about that? Of course. And ask somebody else. To me, the easiest entry level is to read his sermons because they're so easy to read. Now, I think the Institutes are most profound, and I think you could begin with the Institutes, and you'll find them to be very pastoral and very easy to read. I'm very amazed at how much life and energy are in his sermons, and I still think at the end of the day that the preaching of the Word is the primary means of ordinary grace. And I would just urge you to get his sermons on Galatians, his sermons on Ephesians. Uh, they're printed by Banner of Truth. Uh, John Knox on his deathbed called for his wife to bring Calvin's sermons on Ephesians and just read him into heaven, uh, reading Calvin's sermons that he had heard preached years earlier. So I like the sermons just because there's some energy uh, about them and, and, and exhortation about them, but of course the institutes are tremendous. Yeah, I feel the need to jump in here and say that uh, I appreciate the advice to kind of glide into Calvin. Uh, I come at it from a slightly different direction. A friend of mine had a 10-year-old son who had not learned to swim, and he'd been through all the swimming programs. He still couldn't swim. And last summer, he took, the kid, the, took the kid out to the pool, and he said, I want to promise you two things. Number one, I love you. Number two, you won't die. <laughs> And he just threw him in the deep end of the pool, and he said, look, a swimmer. <laughs> and uh, that's really what my advice would be about Calvin. Dive in the deep end of the pool. Start reading the first page of the Institutes. No, read the preface, the introduction, the dedicatory letter to the Institutes. You're going to be drawn in. And uh, if you have to read the Institutes a second or a third time, that would be a tremendous tragedy. Your life would be wasted. I mean, just imagine that. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. I, I really would ad advise that. I, I will tell you that in my experience, it is one of the greatest works of Christian devotional literature ever written. Uh, it is not only good for developing theological acumen and understanding a systematic exposition of the Christian faith to the glory of God, it is a way of coming to know 
in a far more intense and intimate way the God whom we serve and we worship. So I say, jump in the deep end of the pool. I have two promises for you. God loves you and you won't die. Well, um, I'm glad Al Mohler has the courage of his convictions. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised that he, like, I'm pretty sure Ligon would have done this. I did this. I read the Institutes when I was a teenager. Um, but those still were days when people read books and even big books, and the Institutes looked very daunting. So let me just pick up on what Ligon said earlier on about that little uh, five-chapter book, the golden book of the Christian life, and a story. I assigned those chapters to a student in a seminar on Calvin about 15 years ago. I can still see this uh, brother from South Korea sitting at the far end of the table as the seminar began, and he said, he opened it by saying, I am so glad that I had this assignment to read this section on life under the cross and, and uh, all that is involved in meditation in the future life and handling this life. It was his next statement that really stunned me. He said, because it has really helped me to understand my grandfather, you see, he was martyred. Mm. And, uh, you know, that was the end of the seminar, actually. Yeah. Um, but if you are daunted by looking at what looks like two very big books, um, do start there, um, and you, I think you would just be amazed how undaunting Calvin actually is. He's totally undaunting, totally undaunting, and he really draws you in to… to uh, actually, if he hadn't known that J.I. Packer would have done it, he probably would have called the book Knowing God, That's right. <laughs> and it probably would have sold better. <laughs> Uh, tr true confessions, when, uh, when I was a youth director in St. Louis, the 15-year-old kids in my youth group came to me and they said, Lig, we'd like to study Calvin's Institutes with you. And I said, you are going to get me in a world of trouble with your parents because they're going to think that a seminary student foisted this on them. And they insisted, and of course they did get me in a world of trouble with their parents, but we had a great time together. So if, you, if you're going to do the institutes, one thing you could do is go through the institutes with your pastor or with somebody else that's been through the institutes before. Another idea, and I like all the ideas that I've heard, is Sinclair Ferguson did two lectures at Rutherford House, which are still available on audio one on Calvin's commentary on John, one on Calvin's commentary on Romans. Get the modern translation of Calvin's commentary on Romans. It's a, it's a small commentary because Calvin did not believe in being verbose. Brief and clear were his mottos. And you, you could read the commentary on Romans in a couple of sittings. It's not a long commentary. Listen to Sinclair Ferguson's lecture on the commentary of Romans from Rutherford House and then read through the commentary on Romans. And again, you will see how he, the exercise of getting to the point quickly is classically Calvin. The only thing is, in order to understand my lecture, you need to read Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually the easier bit. For each of you, if, if, uh, if you are so inclined, what is one thing about Calvin that is generally unknown or misunderstood that Calvin's heirs should know? I think I, well, I shouldn't say this in the presence of a church historian, but I know what his favorite game was. And I'm keeping it to myself. <laughs> his favorite game was keys, where they would throw a set of keys down the dining room table and the person who got it nearest the end without it going over was the winner. I think that's in America, the only that's Calvinistic actually, game in America that's in actually the punishment world. for your children, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> that's not very well known. No. You, you fulfilled ahead. the mission statement of the question. <laughs> 
I think when people think of Calvin in terms of his biography, what's often missed is the suffering of the man. And uh, when I teach, I want students to understand that this was a man who suffered virtually every day of his adult life. A man who had infirmities, sicknesses, physical strain, stresses, pains that uh, w would go beyond what we'd even want to discuss in this context. He had to, uh, to read and study under the most excruciatingly difficult circumstances. He had emotional and relational suffering, suffering of the heart, the suffering of being rejected, the suffering of opposition, suffering in his family life that was just, just very tragic, death and uh, losing his wife after such a short amount of time, um, grief that comes just out of, uh, of loneliness and, uh, and all the rest. When you know that, what strikes you is the incredible joyfulness of Calvin's writings, the joyfulness of his piety. This was a man who, for the glory of God and by the grace and mercy of God, found tremendous joy in what he was doing. And uh, in some of his letters, you'll find some amazingly candid statements about his struggles. But uh, when he rose to the pulpit, when he sat down to write a theological treatise, when he expressed from his heart the substance of the Christian faith, it comes out as incredible joy. And uh, that in the backdrop of his suffering just makes, uh, makes me appreciate and love him all the more. One thing, one thing that comes to mind if all you know about Calvin is what you heard in a college introductory history class where you were told that he was the tyrant of Geneva that you might not know is that Calvin wasn't even a citizen of Geneva until the last few years of his life, which was about four years that he had a citizenship in Geneva. And so the idea that he was in iron control of all the political machinery of uh, Geneva is incorrect. Now, Al and I were also talking in the green room that in his day, what happened in the pulpit was, was more important than anything that consistory um, or could have pronounced or anything in any canton in Switzerland could. So he had, the, he had the power of influence and persuasion, but in terms of the political mechanics, he wasn't even able to vote. Uh, and there were so many things that were completely out of his control in the city. So that's one interesting thing. I think another thing that people don't know is that Calvin launched a missions movement. Now, of course, if you listen to Steve this morning, you know that, but Calvin was aggressively involved in launching a, a mission movement, not only into Europe, into unchurched places, but even as far as Brazil and other parts of the world. And uh, th that is, is against the stereotypes of people who think, well, Calvin thought that God predestines people, so why in the world would you bother preaching the gospel or evangelizing or doing the work of missions? And of course, he was a, he was a great uh, power in the missions movement of the 16th century. Yeah, I guess the thing to add, to, uh, which has already been said, but we think of Calvin's mind, his genius, but his heart was so passionate towards God. And I think of his personal logo, you know, Luther had his logo, Luther's Rose. Calvin's logo, which summarizes his life, is an open hand being offered up to God and a heart in the palm of the hand, and it was his heart offered to God what is it, promptly and willingly, something like that, um, that that's what he chose to summarize his life with, his life given to God, his heart given to God promptly and willingly. Uh, that's amazing. When you, when you combine that kind of godliness with that kind of genius, then that is a very powerful force, I mean, much like Jonathan Edwards. I think another very striking thing about him is his friends would die for him. They really, they just loved him to death. And uh, he had an amazing number of friends as his correspondence demonstrates. And then in some of the correspondence, I think you just get wee little moments when he kind of breaks through the pain barrier and, you know, he'll say, we read this and we had a really good laugh. You know, I mean, they, they obviously just loved him, and he loved them deeply. Um, and I think that really is, in many ways, the measure of the man by contrast with the, the caricature that we, we get of him. You know, maybe one other thing, too. Um, 
is that not well no, not often known is how opposed he was by his own church for so long. Uh, there were two uh, factions in the church. One was the Patriots, the other was the Libertines. The Patriots were the old established families of Geneva. Calvin was a foreigner, uh, a Frenchman who had been exported into Geneva. They opposed him every time he turned around the Patriots. And then the Libertines were the antinomians who just uh, chafed at his preaching and holding them to an account for coming to the Lord's table. I mean, it was a battle for him. Servetus, you know, was, was burned at the stake in 53, 1553, and they talk about the 10-year period of time uh, in the heart of that, that it's just, it's just called years of opposition from within his own city and within his own congregation as they fought and they battled him. The people named their dogs uh, uh, Calvin. Um, he was called Cain. Um, they would fire shots of uh, ammunition over his house. They threatened to throw him into the river. Um, he would walk through the streets and be ridiculed, etc. They, they would even name their children obscene names. Yes. so that the ministers would be embarrassed when they were performing the baptism right. ceremonies. Right. So for, for any pastors here today who are uh, going through difficult times in your church, I mean, Calvin is a brother with whom we can relate and identify with. I mean, he was put out of his own pulpit earlier and came back only to be opposed for more than 10 years. Well, you've mentioned Servetus, so let's, let's go on and address that. Um, Calvin is often criticized for his role in the execution of Servetus. Can you briefly summarize what happened and uh, our take on, on that matter as best we can articulate it? Well, I mean, it, very briefly, Michael Servetus was a heretic. He, he, the Roman Catholics would have viewed him as a heretic. The Protestants would have viewed him as a heretic. The, the Calvinists, the Lutherans, the, the man was extremely off the charts in terms of the views that he held. He was anti-Trinitarian, but he was a lot more than that. And uh, you need to understand, first of all, that in any city in Europe, there would have been heresy laws in those days. Uh, Geneva was not the only city where a person could get in trouble for teaching doctrine, which was out of accord uh, with the, the church's uh, public theology. And uh, that, that could have happened anywhere in Europe uh, because of the view, uh, first of all, because of the patterns of law which it obtained in medieval uh, times, all the way, stretching all the way back to the Justinian Code, there were certain expectations in terms of public theology and morality that were expected of everyone. And so, uh, Servetus was warned not to come to Geneva. He was told by Calvin personally, if you come to Geneva, you will be arrested and you will be tried. And he came back to Geneva anyway and um, eventually was tried and found guilty of heresy and was uh, by the council condemned to be burned at the stake. And Calvin actually asked that the sentence be changed to something that would be less painful. I don't know, what, what was it beheading or, or something quick? Um, and that was denied by the consistory because it was a consistory who had the right to exercise the judgment in the case. So Al, tell them the rest of the story. Well, I, I think it's difficult for us to have a conversation about this because we're sitting in the year 2009. We're thinking in terms of a, a modern democratic republic. We're thinking in terms of, uh, of a model of, of citizenship and government and the relationship between the church and the state, which was utterly unthinkable. Uh, in, the, uh, in the medieval world, and you're talking about the late medieval, early modern world, you're talking about the 16th century, when every single European state would have defined heresy as treason. It, it would have been basically one and the same crime, because uh, in the understanding of a unitary state, to, uh, to oppose by the teaching or advocacy of heresy what was integral to the identity of the state and the legitimacy of the regime was indeed to, uh, to put oneself against the entirety of the civilization. Now, we live in a time in which heresy uh, gets you on the front page of the paper, on the cable news networks, and on the bestseller lists. But uh, in the ancient uh, world, uh, in the medieval world, uh, in uh, even the early modern world, uh, 
Heresy was understood to be a threat to the entire society. Now, by the way, I believe that's true. I believe the heresy is a threat that goes beyond anything human treason can touch. However, I do not believe the government is the rightful agent to deal with the issue of heresy. I think that's the problem. You had a unitary state, and uh, one of the big complexities in coming to understand Calvin's Geneva is actually beginning to understand how Calvin's Geneva becomes a model for separating the role of the church and the state. But by the time you're in 1553, you, you still have a state that sees Servetus as a threat. You still have a unitary model. And Servetus was the kind of heretic who wanted to make sure everyone knew of his heresy. He was a needler, he was a self-promoter, he was a liar. Uh, he, had, uh, he had posed as someone else. Uh, he had, he had uh, ingratiated himself with some hosts only who found out that he was later a heretic. He had befriended some only to be, uh, to be discovered later who, who he actually was in terms of his heresy. He was wanted by the Church of Rome for heresy. Had he been in Rome or Florence or, uh, or, or Seville or any other uh, Italian city-state, uh, he would also have been executed. He would have been executed virtually anywhere because in that world, heresy and treason were one and the same crime. Now, I believe the modern world gets it wrong by believing that treason is a serious crime and heresy is a trifle. We should see heresy as the far greater danger, the far greater error, and the greater sin. But we need to understand, however, that we would not call upon the state to deal with heresy, but rather the church. And, and that, I think, is the proper distinction between Calvin's time and ours. Calvin was a man of his time. He was ahead of his time, but uh, he was still a man of his time. And so were those who were uh, uh, of the officers of the consistory of Geneva. Nor, nor was he the last, you know. Um, he really has become the whipping boy for something that continued for another hundred years in all of, civili all of civilization, you know. Just a couple of quick wrap-up points. Number one, Calvin did not put him to death. Calvin was not the prosecution. He was only the expert witness who was called to testify. Calvin was not even a citizen of Geneva at the time. He had no vote. He had no say in any such political matter. At the time, the city fathers on the consistory were his enemies, and so Calvin had no influence even over the men who did it. Um, Servetus, uh, it's not that the Roman Catholic Church would have condemned him. They already had condemned him in France. And so he is a wanted fugitive from the Catholic Church in France and from the French government. Uh, Servetus was given the option of being released to go back to France, and he begged to stay under whatever would happen to him in Geneva because he knew what the Roman Catholic Church would do to him. In France, it would be far more gruesome, so he chose to stay. The city fathers of Geneva appealed to the other Swiss cities, asked for their counsel, and unanimously the other cities, you know, Zurich, Bern, etc., they all said put him to death. So it's not that Geneva just stood alone in this thing. Also, it's the only one that they treated this way by contrast to the Roman Catholic Church and the Inquisition and hundreds of thousands of people being put to death. So, I mean, but Calvin didn't do it, and, and, and yet it continues to be laid at his feet. Now, he did give, you know, support to what was taking place, but it was not in his hands to do it. Yeah, you know, just to piggyback on what Steve is saying here, intellectual honesty is a rare commodity when <laughs> something like this comes up. But intellectual honesty would force us to say, if Calvin's participation, because there was participation in the trial of Servetus, uh, Calvin did warn Servetus that if he came to Geneva, this would be the logical and uh, almost uh, automatic outcome of his arrival. Uh, what, what you have in this is the, the intellectual honesty that will compel us to say, if we cannot then hear Calvin, we cannot hear anyone in the medieval or the ancient church. Yeah. We can't hear anyone right. until uh, you arrive, uh, oh, at, I guess the last 150 years of that, uh, you know, in, in terms of, uh, of history. And uh, so to single Calvin out in this case is just a, an ad hominem argument that needs to be identified for what it is. But we need to respond with the intellectual honesty, actually just say, let's look at what happened and uh, let's understand that, uh, that this civilization understood heresy to be the greatest of all threats. This was done not only to make a theological point, but 
uh, it was done by the Genevans in order to protect the people from error. Now, I believe they did it the wrong way, but I am not particularly happy to live in a time that considers heresy a small threat. Amen. Thank you. That's a tough question. Thank you for all those answers. What was Calvin's relationship with Martin Luther and with Luther's followers? Sinclair, you were there. Uh, well, <laughs> I, it's true I was there, but I, I never graduated. Well, it was, it was distant. They, as far as I know, they, I'm pretty sure they never met. Um, it's clear in Calvin's writings he, ha he, he felt the entire church owed an enormous debt to Luther, to, you know, unspeakable debt, regarded Luther virtually as a new apostle, as somebody that God had, had wonderfully raised up. I think was a bit discombobulated uh, by the fact that uh, there were elements in Luther's theology that troubled him. But as far as I know, he was as careful as he possibly could be to correct Luther's theology without making it very plain it was Luther's theology he was correcting. And actually, I personally think that the whole, the whole element of Calvin's Christology and its relationship to his understanding of the Lord's Supper um, is very much uh, focused on what he regarded as the mistake in Luther's understanding of the supper derived from what he saw as a mistake in Luther's Christology, which Calvin actually thought was potentially hugely serious. But the way in which he handled it, that I suspect that the unwitting reader of the Institutes would have almost no idea he was saying, actually, I'm talking He, he had a different kind of relationship with Melanchthon um, and in, in some ways was a wee bit more prepared to headbutt with Melanchthon because he thought Melanchthon at times was pussyfooting on, if I can call it this way, although it's an anachronism, Luther's very strong Calvinism. He, th he, was, he was concerned to see the way that, that uh, Melanchthon tended to water down some of the sharp edges of uh, Luther's understanding of the sovereignty of grace and bondage of the will and so on. Uh, just, just very briefly, I, I want to affirm that, but I also want to say you, you have to make, I think, a distinction between different phases in Calvin's career and experience, because very early on, he clearly saw Luther as the great champion of the faith, and uh, he always considered Luther like a father to him, spiritually and theologically. So. Uh, in, in Calvin, you have a very warm respect for Luther. Uh, it speaks of him in the most exalted and, and kind and grateful terms. His relationship with Melanchthon is very interesting because it appears that early on, Calvin had the hope that there could be a union of the churches of the Reformation. And he, he saw Melanchthon, a, a person with whom he could have good conversation. He has wonderful correspondence with him. Uh, you know, they, they did meet, and uh, you have a, a different kind of uh, relationship there. But you have a distancing because as Calvin sees Melanchthon uh, progressively dealing with, uh, with different issues as they arise, uh, one of the interesting things is that Calvin addresses Melanchthon about the continuation of the, uh, of the, of the uh, Roman church's festival days in Wittenberg. And uh, he's, he's very troubled by what he sees as a continuing uh, refusal to bring the Reformation to its, its necessary conclusion and uh, eventually comes to understand that it's simply not going to happen. There's a distancing that happens over time. But I think uh, as I look at, at Calvin and I, I look at Geneva, I, I, I see him continuing and taking further to, uh, to its, its consistent end, what he believed the cause of the Reformation, the purity of the church, the integrity of the gospel would demand. And uh, so 
again, the only thing I, w I would add to that is that I, I think there was a tremendous amount of indebtedness and affection. And at certain points in Calvin's uh, pilgrimage, I think there was a, a hope that there could be a greater unity, but there was a disappointment in the direction that uh, I think the underlying the thing went. here is the first Reformation everywhere was Lutheran. You know, I mean, we were taught when we were little boys at school, Scotland followed Calvin. It eventually followed Calvin. But first of all, the, the early reformers in Scotland were all Lutherans. And, and in Scotland, Knox piggybacked on that. So, that, you know, that, that was, I think there was a tremendous affection for Luther throughout the, the early 16th century into the middle of the 16th century. Calvin attempted to write to Luther on how many occasions? Two, three occasions? And Melanchthon kept the letters from going through to Luther because he, he felt that Luther would be provoked by it. He didn't think it would be constructive. And so Luther never saw the correspondence that Calvin had written. Are there aspects of Calvin's thoughts, at least in your thinking, that we should not follow? You've got two Baptists on this planet. <laughs> You're right, what was I thinking? Anything that can be constructed. You you go first, Sinclair. <laughs> Well, let me look on the list. <laughs> John, you, you asked the question, so I, I, okay. I, will, I will dare to uh, jump in. These the Baptists, the there they go again. <laughs> you know, I, I think one issue that, that interestingly and perhaps even helpfully arises here is the definition of what is Calvinism. You know, because when, uh, when the average person speaks of Calvinism, they're thinking of uh, a Dordian summary of, uh, of a Calvinist soteriology. But, uh, you know, there are debates among Calvinist as to what Calvinism would require. Um, I, I'm a Baptist who is incredibly indebted to John Calvin. All Baptists, whether they know it or not, are incredibly indebted to John Calvin. And uh, I think it is an entirely wholesome and wonderful thing to look back at that indebtedness and to recognize that uh, we would not be where we are as Baptists had it not been for the Reformation and uh, for what was recovered in gospel and the understanding of the church. So when you ask the question, I say, obviously, there, when you look at the totality of what Calvin taught, I would argue that there are a lot of Presbyterians that aren't thoroughly Calvinist, you know, simply because you're looking at the application of a model and uh, of, of, a, of a system that, that just isn't replicated everywhere. But I'm going to champion the Calvinism that is a theology that begins with the glory of God, the principle of the sovereignty of God and His holiness, His grace and His mercy, and points to soteriology as the display of God's glory in the church through the salvation of sinners and the justification of those sinners. And uh, I'm going to be very, very thankful for all that I have received from Calvin. Uh, but I think Calvin would be the very first to say the last thing he meant to produce was Calvinists but rather people who would, uh, who would give themselves also to the reformation of the church yeah. by the word of God. Thank you. We're all familiar with uh, the terminology of the five points of Calvinism. Uh, what would you say was truly central to Calvin's own theology, uh, more or less from the five? Well, for Calvin, they're, they're really such a unity, I think, you know. I, I don't think he would give precedence to any one of them except perhaps a logical precedence in how the gospel actually operates. Um, as far as I can see from reading from the early institutes through the later institutes, it seems to me two things happen in his own theological, his own theological development that because you see evidence of them as the institutes grows, I think must have been driving principles in his thinking. Um, the first, actually, I think, was the tremendous influence on, on, of Romans on the way he thought theologically. Now, that's, a kind of, that's almost like a background matter. It's not that 
the Institutes is an exposition of Romans, but you can see that the way Paul's mind works in Romans began to shape the way in which Calvin's mind worked. The second thing that uh, seems to me to dominate the development of the uh, Institutes is his immense Trinitarianism, um, both the unity of the Trinity, the, his appreciation of the, the distinctives of each person within the Trinity, his appreciation of how uh, God Himself is the gospel, um, and that leads him to uh, the, the, what I think probably is a high watermark of Christological thought that you, that you get in Calvin. Um, I mean, in some areas of his thinking, it almost seems as though he's the first Christian writer to get this just right. But I think those two elements, the, the mode of approach to the gospel that's Pauline and the Trinitarianism, um, that I think we are very much lost. Um, I, it's very, it's actually, it's very, um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, f I think, for 21st century people to understand why did the early fathers fuss so much about how they described the Trinity? And their answer, I think, would have been, we love him so much, it's our responsibility to describe him as magnificently as we can. And I think that was something that really, really gripped Calvin and, and is one of the great things that we, we need to learn from him today. And I think that then set up the platform for what you find in, in the, the later Reformation tradition as, as later writers uh, tried to work that through into the, into the whole nature of the Christian life. Um, I think what you said about um, that all of those five points really are molded into one is a very good word, and we've learned from R.C. how the doctrines of grace really are welded into one truth. So I don't think you can separate out one, single out one over the other. And uh, Calvin was extremely Trinitarian. And I think that as we look at the doctrines of grace, we need to be Trinitarian. The unity within the Godhead is preserved in the doctrines of grace. And for me, that is a compelling argument even for definite atonement, that, that God is one in His saving purposes, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're not divided in their saving purposes. And Calvin certainly preserves the unity of God's saving purposes. I'll never forget as a theology student reading the Institutes uh, in a new way, um, with different eyes. And to know that the knowledge of, of, that is given to us in Scripture is the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves is to me the, the, the beginning and end uh, of theology for Calvin. Uh, the knowledge of God is the issue. The knowledge of ourselves is derivative. Uh, the knowledge of ourselves, once we come to know God, is the sum and substance of the gospel. And uh, so when people talk about Calvinism and they, they, they jump to the uh, five points of Calvinism, uh, we need to realize that, that we are, uh, we're there reducing Calvin's great concern and passion for the knowledge of God to this vitally important dimension of, of how God justifies sinners. And, uh, and, and how God determined before the world was created uh, that He would uh, save a people through the blood of the Son and elect people, a specific people. How His sovereignty works as, as, as not just a, a principle, but rather as the manifestation of His glory in every dimension of theology so that, that Calvin helps us to understand what a sovereign God, who a sovereign God is and how a sovereign God acts. and, and all the rest, I would just warn us against reducing, uh, reducing Calvinism to points as much as I'm going to defend those points. 
and as much as uh, that emerged out of an historical context in which those very truths are being denied then and now. But I want to be the first to say you can miss the whole for the parts if you are not careful. That's a good word. I think it's helpful when you're reading Calvin to remember a couple of things. Uh, one, he did not sit down and write out five points at any point in his theology. That does result from a, a council that occurs almost 50 years after his death um, by people that are faithfully reproducing uh, the theological emphases of his writing in a polemic context where five points of Arminianism have been articulated and rejoining those five points of Arminianism, they come up with what we now call the five points of Calvinism. It's important for you to know that. I think it's important uh, that you recognize that Calvinism historically is in continuity. A lot of people you can pick up and they'll say, you have Calvin and then you have the Calvinists, and the Calvinists were actually uh, abandoning Calvin's theological legacy and uh, John Wesley and uh, various universal atonement advocates are really closer to Calvin than John Owen and uh, such. So if you run across that kind of book, throw it away. Uh, read something else. Uh, not helpful. Uh, I think it's also important when you're reading Calvin to recognize he doesn't use terminology like later Reformed theologians use terminology. He will use the term regeneration in a much broader way than we use it. Regeneration refers to the whole of life. He'll use the word conversion to refer to the whole of life, and so you have to watch the terminology. It, it's the, the source of much confusion by people that are looking to go back and pull out a proof-texted sentence from Calvin to prove their particular point of view and they don't even realize how Calvin's using the terminology in that particular place. So you have to watch out for the terminology when you're reading uh, Calvin. Uh, and the, the last thing I would say is simply this. A lot of people look for what's, what's Calvin's controlling idea. This was, it was very popular about 30 years ago uh, and, and a little bit earlier than that in Calvin study circles to talk about what's Calvin's controlling idea. And some people will argue, well, the sovereignty of God or predestination or whatever. And Calvin doesn't have, he, did, he, didn't, he didn't deduce his theology from some sort of a philosophically uh, concocted controlling idea. His, his theology, sure, is, is impacted by the broad reading that he had engaged in and the deep thinking that he did, but it really is built out of his exposition of Scripture. So what you end up in Calvin is you have numerous key ideas that will play out over and over and over in different areas as he's doing exposition and then as he's synthesizing that exposition. But he's not deducing his theology from some prior principle. He's, he's really trying to build it out of a faithful exposition of Scripture. How, how is uh, this conference is a testament to our affection and thankfulness to God for Calvin. How has that become something that's seen as a tradition that is... Um, over-reverencing him, uh, over-elevating him, and that is competing with our other uh, commitments of sola scriptura. How did that happen and what should we do about it so that we don't keep projecting that wrong, wrong reliance on him, if you could call it that? I'm sure there's a multi-sided answer to that. One, I think, is uh, the point that Al was making, the five points of Calvinism are the points at which Calvin's biblical theology came under attack. And when that happens and people rush to the defense, then you tend to get isms emerging, not necessarily bad isms, but those points at which you defend the gospel and set the gospel off against the false then tend to be viewed as though they were the whole package. And I think that is something that actually uh, has happened, which is actually one of the reasons why I think when people go back to read Calvin himself, um, they, they discover a totally different world from the world they expected to find. And then also, in the main, when they go back to study those who became known as Calvinists, they, you begin to see that that really was the, the periphery of 
what they were doing. They were called Calvinists because of the things that they were defending. And often, I think we lose sight of the riches of the gospel mm. that they were actually proclaiming. So in a way, Calvinism arises as, a, as an ism out of the fact that there are points at which it stands in contrast with the wisdom of the world. And so the world uh, gets irritated, focuses on these points. We rush to the defense of these points. And in the process, we often can be in danger of losing our moorings and the totality of the gospel itself. Yeah. I think one of the contemporary temptations uh, we face and, and as a, a seminary president, I have to see you, I, I see this in seminary students sometimes, especially brand new, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed students. They arrive on campus, and uh, somehow many of them are imbued with the idea that they have to uh, think the whole faith anew, that it's somehow their responsibility to, uh, to start and imagine the entire construction and systematic exposition. Well, the reality is, there isn't one of us who's up to that. Uh, each of us has a genealogy. We, we do in terms of a family. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a way we arrived at being born, and our identity is, is somewhere in there. That doesn't mean we're uncritical about all our relatives, right? <laughs> but it does mean that, that we're a part of something. We're a part of a family. And the very fact that someone shows up as a believer, it, it, there's, already, there's already some kind of genealogy back there in terms of how all this happens. Uh, we, we need without apology to say, this is where we belong. Now, here is a strength, N not because of, of, of birth or, or mere happenstance or personal preference or aesthetic choice, but because of, of a deep concern for the truth, this is, this is where I stand. This is the family uh, in, uh, that I belong to in terms of, of Christian history. This is the trajectory that I want to identify with. And then I would simply go back to what, what Calvin said very clearly, and, and which I tried to make clear in, in my message earlier today. Uh, he put a great deal of responsibility on the congregation, the congregation as learners, as those who would judge what they were hearing from the pulpit by their own careful scrutiny and reading of the Word of God. Well, that's the way we need to read Calvin. We need to follow Calvin's admonition as to how to read him. We need to read him. We need to test him by the Scripture. That's, that, that, is, that, that is, I would suggest, the proper balance. But, you know, a, a, as much as I might disagree with, uh, with my ancestors on any number of issues, I wouldn't be who I am and I wouldn't be here if God had not used them. In the providence of God, John Calvin, in the right place in the right time, distilled the faith in the context of the reform of the church in such a way that without apology, I want to say, that's where I belong, that's where I stand, because I love the Bible uh, as the Word of God and, and, and trust its authority and see it most clearly displayed in the embrace of its truth and in the display of its truth uh, in this tradition, that, that, that's where I belong. But uh, I think we just need to follow Calvin's advice, who will be the first to tell us. You read the Institutes you read my sermons, you read anything I write with the Bible open beside you, and you test what I write by the Scriptures. Yeah, as far as over-reverencing Calvin, I mean, when we say a Calvinist, I simply mean a Biblicist, someone who is going back to the Scripture with a literal hermeneutic, not only sola scriptura, but tota scriptura, which means all of Scripture and a comprehensive view of all of Scripture where I'm not picking and choosing which chapters in the Bible I want to believe and passing over others. So for me, I, I, I don't mean, I, I certainly esteem him, but by that nickname, I simply mean one who stands with Calvin in the pursuit of exegeting the text of Scripture and the analogy of Scripture taking one text in light of the whole of Scripture, you know, I applaud that, and I'm inspired by one who did that well. Just to say that our non-Calvinistic friends can be intimidated and sometimes hurt by that identification. We don't mean it that way, uh, but they, they, they get hurt by that. I, I, I'm just reading a book by a couple of them the other day where they get all hurt 
about the very famous B.B. Warfield statement that Calvinism is just Christianity come into its own. And they just, they spaz out on that. And they go for three pages about how that hurts their feelings. And, um, and I, I just, I do think it's helpful for you when you're talking with friends. It's more important that someone have a high view of God, a high view of Christ, a high view of the Bible that it is for them to attach themselves to any labels that we bring along. The reason that we, the, typically the good reason that we use labels is for theological shorthand. It allows us to say a lot really quickly, and it allows us, again, through shorthand, to describe what the church has talked about in its exposition of Scripture over the last 2,000 years and, and ruling some things out. Nope, that's not a legitimate uh, interpretation of that passage, and if you go that way, it's going to lead you into trouble, and we call that this. And nope, you can't do that. So we, we've come up with labels to protect us and to do theological shorthand. And uh, while we all have certain pre-understandings, sometimes that we bring to the text that get corrected, sometimes that we bring to the text and get confirmed, all of us want to sit under the authority of Scripture. And so when you're dealing with friends that are afraid of Calvinistic terminology and categories, I'd encourage you to just go in there as another Christ-exalting, Bible-believing Christian and say, let's sit down and read the Bible together and see what God says to us in His Word. And Calvin would be pleased for us to place ourselves under the Word that way, to seek a knowledge of God that does not come, as Al said this morning, from something we thought up today, but comes from His Word, because we can't know Him unless He reveals Himself to us. Final question. Just each of you leave us with something very important and significant to you that you have learned from Calvin's life or writings? Just one thing. Um, I think for me, he has been the model of what a gospel minister in a local congregation should be. Um, he, he preached, every second week he, he preached probably eight sermons. The other week, he probably preached five. Um, he, as Al said this morning, he counseled, but I think he understood that the counseling arose either out of emergency crisis that he was able to help, or because under the ministry of the Word, all the filth and the sludge of human hearts uh, came to the surface. And I, if, if I understood Al aright when he commented on the the, the almost tsunami of counseling programs that there are in seminaries. Um, I, I feel the church desperately needs, and the Reformed Church, and the Presbyterian Church, desperately needs to get back to the centrality of the ministry of the Word mm. that characterized mm. Calvin's preaching. Um, because, you know, you just need to read his sermons to think, Boy, you know, if I could take my lunchtime and go and listen to this fellow preaching for 40 minutes, asthmatic as he was, struggling for breath as he sometimes must have been, this would be mind-changing and life-changing. Um, and I, you know, I, someday I'm going, to, I'm going to borrow some of Al Mohler's courage and I'm going to write an article <laughs> on do our Christian counselors, when somebody comes and plonks themselves down in front of them, do they ask these questions? Number one, what ministry of the Word is your life placed under? Number two, how often is the Word ministered? Number three, are you there every time the Word is ministered? And it terrifies me, actually, that those questions are not asked and what terrifies me even more is that in the, in the tsunami of counseling movements, the counselors themselves might regard those questions as irrelevant, all of which is an indication, I think, to us, we have no idea what the ministry of the Word really is, nor what the ministry of the Word 
really accomplishes. And here is this totally unspectacular man. There probably was never a laugh in his, in his church. And there's some humor in his sermons, but probably people were too embarrassed to laugh. Um, just patiently unfolding the Scriptures. It transformed lives, and it gave multitudes of young men the courage to be martyrs for the gospel. And we are, we are crying out for ministries like that. Not necessarily, you know, the kind of ministries of people like Ligon or, or Albeg or Steve, but just people in local congregations feeding the people of God with the Word of God, which is, at the end of the day, all Calvin thought he was doing. He, he, was, a, he was a local minister. And we are, I mean, I couldn't say how desperately I feel we're in need of writing the evangelical ship there because it produces real Christian character and nothing else produces it the same way. We need to pray to God that that will happen. What's the question again? <laughs> Something significant and important that you've learned from Calvin's life or writings. To me, to understand Calvin is to understand Calvin the preacher. He was many things, theologian, author, statesman, reformer, but on his 400-year anniversary, this is the 500, but as they gathered in Geneva, that was what was reinforced is Calvin the preacher. And I think that is what is so desperately needed in the church today is to return, you know, the Reformed worship service was a very simple worship service. There weren't a lot of bells and whistles and breaking from the Catholic Church. It was one man and a Bible and a singing congregation, the Lord's Supper, and the, a less is more approach and the primacy of the Word of God. And with everything that's added to the worship service, there's a displacing of the preaching of the Word of God. And as I read Calvin, it's just it, his industry, his energy, his, his commitment. I mean, not only did he preach out of the New Testament on Sunday morning, the New Testament <clears throat> or Psalm Sunday evening, but Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning, Saturday morning, every other week. I mean, there's so many pastors today who are whining about having to preach on Sunday night, uh, whining about having to preach on Wednesday night. I mean, these reformers lived to preach. Uh, Spurgeon lived to preach. Whitfield, Edwards, I mean, these men were preachers of the Word of God. And Calvin, to me, is just a preacher of the Word of God, but by being so committed to verse-by-verse -verse exposition, that requires even greater mental energy to make every text sit up and walk, to, for there to be life in every text, to be released to the congregation. So that is what impresses me as I take away from my just st study of Calvin, is devotion to the pulpit, to the preaching of the Word of God. I am so fundamentally in agreement with what uh, both of my brothers have already said that uh, I'll make this comment brief, except to point out that, that Calvin was also a teacher. And Calvin understood the necessity of the church to be, to the glory of God, a learning people. Uh, the church to be a school. And I desperately pray to see our churches return to being schools of Christ. And uh, to see those who will teach and bear the responsibility of the preaching ministry rightly taught. And at the end of the day, I want to die like Calvin died, studying and preaching and teaching to the end, learning until there comes that day when we see no longer through a glass darkly. Um, I mean, Calvin didn't retire. He died. Calvin taught me that the fundamental problem that we face as human beings is idolatry, not atheism. There's no such thing as an atheist. There are worshipers of the true God and they're idolaters, and that's all. And um, that's huge for Calvin, and that became huge for me just reading through the Institutes with David Calhoun. 
many years ago. Um, the doctrine of the atonement. Um, Calvin gave the best biblical exposition of the doctrine of the atonement that had been given in 1,560 years of the church's existence. Now, there have been great expositions of the doctrine of the atonement in the last 400 or so years, for which I thank God, and I, I've read a lot of them, but there's nobody that compares to Calvin to, to that time in history in terms of expounding the meaning and significance of the death of Christ. And then I've got to mention, because because of the paper that I got to give this morning, just Calvin's idea of piety and what the true Christian life is like is just a life-transforming thing. So all three of those things. Can we say thank you to our distinguished panel, and we'll end here. Thank you, gentlemen.